Emily Longaretta, Variety's Senior TV Features Editor, and I am your host for today's Half Hour with If These Walls Could Sing, a Disney original documentary. I am so honored to introduce Mary McCartney. Mary, I want to kind of just start off if you could give the audience a quick overview of the doc before we dive in. Well, the documentary is a 90-minute feature doc about the 990 year history of Abbey Road Studios, which was the first purpose-built boarding studio. Nice. Um, it's historic and, you know, it's all known for the 60s music, but it was actually opened in 1931. So yeah, lots of surprises and stories along the way. Let's show the trailer. When you enter a place with so much history around it. It's heavy, he's my brother, take one. It's kind of sacred in a way. People want to come here. They want the sound of Abbey Road. My name is Mary. Abbey Road Studios has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. So many massive records were made here. People don't believe that it was just done by accident. We're trying to get better with things like recording. This was our home. You spent so much time here. We had used a particular... There it is. From classical to pop, artists are inspired to push creative boundaries within these walls. What are you doing? It's murder. I can't keep it up. It was in the forefront of one of the biggest musical changes. The smell of Abbey Road. It's actually the smell of fear. Am I going to mess this up? <laughs> A huge part of my record collection was made in this room. There's been a year of despair for the record industry. 60s bands just aren't selling records anymore. We stayed empty for month after month. Something had to be done. We needed to move into another area to survive. Who doesn't want to do Star Wars? Suddenly it was like opening a Christmas present. Abbey Road, it's a gift to music. When we made Dark Side of the Moon, I thought we've cracked it. If it hadn't been for him, we'd have made like three albums. It encourages you to make something moving. The walls are saturated with great music. You know, if these walls could sing. It's so exciting. I was smiling through that entire thing. Yeah. I couldn't stop, which is exactly how I felt when I was watching the doc. Um, I, I want to kind of start at the beginning as to why you wanted to do this now. Why was now the right time for this? Well, I think that they had been talking about making a history of Abbey Road documentary for a little while, but the, um, they were looking for the right director. And uh, I've, this is my first you know, time directing a feature documentary. But um, I have, I'm friends with a really amazing producer called John Batsek, who produced Searching for Sugarman and One Day in September. And he contacted me um, and invited me to be part of the project. So at first I have to admit, I was a little, I couldn't, I couldn't quite tell if it was the right first project for me, but you know, once I, signed up I never look back it was the best yeah. experience I, I mean obviously you have such a personal connection to it was mm. there any part of you that was hesitant in that way to dive into something that also it's not just a, a career and things that 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 for you it's it's a personal connection um I the, the thing that made me hesitate the most was throughout my career as a photographer or dipping into directing or you know anything I do um cook, cooking show host crazy range of things but I always sort of have always been like I need to stand on my own two feet and so this time I just thought well, the closeness of the you know the, the fact that I am so close to Abbey Road I thought would that be a problem but um it was something I considered but then I realized the thing with documentary making is you really need to pick a subject that you feel passionate about mm -hmm. and I really feel passionate about Abbey Road yeah. I mean I've been going there since I was a kid and I still, even working on this and, and record and, you know, doing the interviews there, walking inside the studio, the, that feeling of um, how lucky you are to sort of be inside those walls never really goes away for me. Yeah, definitely. What, I mean, I know you were so young when you first went and you talk about this a little bit in the doc, mm -hmm. but when, what's your first memory of being in the studio? 
I mean, my first memory is visiting my mum and dad at the studio because we lived nearby and um, we would go there and visit mum and dad like in their recording break. So, you know, my mum would be playing keyboards. Um, dad, you know, they'd be recording with the band Wings. So, yeah, that's my early childhood memories. And then when I left college, I had a, a job in the music industry and I would go to Abbey Road. I really got to know the people that work there then. They've got a real family feel. So I became sort of part of like knowing more the inner workings of it as a studio. But I still didn't know anything about the actual history of it. Wow. Okay. So when did you start doing the research into it? Did you start doing it before you started making the doc or was it something like, or was it something you started researching and then were like, Oh, I want to get involved in this. I had a great story producer and I basically locked her in my studio and we wrote out, I kind of just got a pen and paper and we started writing out the chronology of what, you know, when the studio opened until present day and mm -hmm. stuck it up all around the room on the wall so I could sort of see the scale of the, the timeline. And then from there, it was a case of sort of trying to figure out what we had archived for. Some things we just didn't have any archive to be able to illustrate it. So it opened up a whole sort of world of issues to fix, which um, I think is, again, documentary filmmaking. I was gonna say part of the job, part of the- yeah. It was very, it was like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm, definitely. How long did it take you? When did you start working on this to now when it's coming out? Um, I think from, from start to finish, it was just over a year, a year and a half. But there was a little gap where I kind of, I started, as I said, I researched quite heavily, came up with kind of beats for the story that we could tell and then left the interviews, you know, left it to the edit so it could change in the edit. But I made sure in the interview process, I had, a, I interviewed the, the, you know, the subjects myself. I had a list of questions with beats. I kind of needed them to hit to be able to sort of tell the story I wanted to. But, you know, that changed in the edit, but, but I, you know, I still needed to be quite organized because it's sure. a complicated history with different genres of music, well, and that's kind of, I want to talk a little about that. I mean, being your first feature doc directing, it's such a challenge, I would assume, to kind of map out how you want it to be, because before you go into the interviews, you have one idea. And I assume after the interviews, that changes because you never know what the stories you're going to uncover and things like that. Was that something that you approached and you handled during? Yeah, that was something, you know, we'd sort of research and write things and say, well, ask them about this. And then thinking we'll do a big section and you know sometimes the artist couldn't really remember about it or the story that I'd been told was more folklore and they didn't remember the way it sort of had become sort of expressed throughout the history so um so that was the case but then it didn't really matter because it became quickly quite clear that I think my experience as a portrait photographer um really paid off because I mean, I was thinking about it and there were lots of very interesting facts that I hadn't heard of before, but ultimately for me to be brought on, job, on to work on this project, I think the reason they asked me is they know that I like a sense of emotion mm -hmm. and that when I work with people, I like to really sort of connect and get a chemistry between us and make it feel quite human and emotive. So I worked very hard on making the interviews very conversational quite informal and relaxed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the aim to make the viewer feel like they were in the room with us. Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely achieved that. Um, before we continue, I wanna to throw to a little clip. My name is Mary. Abbey Road Studios has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. Every time I walk through these corridors, it feels magical. I don't remember the first time I came here. This is me in Studio Two, a photograph taken by my mum, who was a photographer and was in a band with my dad. I want to tell the story of some of the iconic recordings made here over the last nine decades. 
from classical to pop to film scores. One of the reasons I wanted to do this documentary was I remember seeing a picture of Mum leading Jet across the zebra crossing. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, what happened was we lived close by, as you know, and um, we had this little pony called Jet. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a nice, nice uh, touch of the personal touches that you were talking about that in your interviews, you make sure to really tell those stories, of course, with with your father of course that's going to be a little bit more emotional than others but how how much of that did you want to mix into it and how important was it for you to have pretty much a I don't know if it was half and half or what it was for you to have a in a personal look while also being really like telling the history of this iconic place that so many people haven't had the honor to go to yeah it was funny because I had not the, re the way that I saw that picture of my mum leading the pony across the zebra crossing was actually one day years ago I was at Abbey Road Studios for a meeting and I was flicking through like the book their history book and I saw this picture that I'd never seen before of my mum leading a pony across and I just thought it was so <laughs> her and so funny and so sweet um that literally when I was asked to do this project, that's the image that came into my mind. And I was like, if for nothing else, if I get to just make that photo famous, then I've done my job. One of the big things that was always in my mind was this idea that when you go to Abbey Road Studios, it's in London in a very kind of residential, central area of London, but a residential area. And there's a zebra crossing and there's always visitors on that zebra crossing taking pictures from all around the world. So I've grown up seeing them there. And there's always, even on Christmas day, there are people there. Um, and I was aware that a lot of people, because Abbey Road is still a very busy working studio, a lot of people will not be as, as lucky to come in and experience that feeling or really understand what's going on inside. But they're all there, like it's a pilgrimage for them. And you can see that it really, really means a lot more than just sort of having a picture in a tourist attraction. Yeah. So that was always and that was always sort of forefront of my mind was wouldn't it be great to make the official Abbey Road documentary, which is basically all around bringing the people, you know, those people that make that pilgrimage inside the studio to really see the nuts and bolts of what's going on and meet the people that are working there. Was the title always set? Because it seems, I mean, I couldn't think of anything more perfect, but when did that come into it? The title was set. Yeah. Uh, when I was invited to do it. Yes, okay. the title was there. And I really liked it. So yeah. thought, keep it. Absolutely. I mean, it's um, very descriptive. Yeah, it really is. It really paints a photo in, in four yeah. words, which is so, so incredible. Um, for, for you, in the specifics of directing, what was your biggest challenge overall in this project? Uh, my biggest challenge was actually oddly getting the studio time to use the studio as my location because it's so busy at the moment so I needed to sort of block out the days or the afternoons when they didn't have a recording session there mm -hmm. and then the other challenge was in the documentary I kind of do these um days of beauty shots of the studio completely empty with nothing inside so you know, there's a lot of equipment packed into that space. So, you know, we had to clear the walls and move things out into the hallway. So, you know, that was, you know, I was adamant that I wanted the beauty shots with nothing inside. So it was a blank canvas. Yeah. I mean, as a photographer, that must be, there, there's some must be such specifics that you have that you bring to it because you have a different eye than I would assume many directors have. Uh, I think... It meant, I think the way, when I look at the documentary now, the things that I think I brought to it from my experience as a photographer is, as I say, the interviews, because as a portrait photographer, I like to sort of set the scene, have the set ready, lit, make a nice sort of experience for the sitter to be in and be prepared so that when they arrive, I don't kind of keep them waiting around too much because I think that can be a bit off-putting. Um, and then making it a calm space without too many people around to distract it. So have an intimacy about it. Yeah. But also it, within the documentary, I, I kind of think um, 
this idea of, you know, I wanted different textures and more than it being talking heads and the studio, I wanted a lot of archive. So there's a lot of archive intertwined, a lot of setting the scene in London at the time uh, and, and photography, film, color, black and white. So it sort of has different textures, which I also kind of love that collage of mm -hmm. media. And you did obviously mention the Talking Heads and they, you have so many incredible people. I think this is the first documentary that I've watched that I didn't really need to look down at the Chiron because everyone you have is an icon. Um, and it's so, in, so incredible to get who, who I guess for you was the toughest or the person that maybe you knew in the beginning, you need, we need to have this person, we need to have their story in there. And that kind of built around there. Well, I, when I took on the project, I mean, the main concern was what if when I approach people, they don't agree to be interviewed because then I really would have been quite screwed because in a recording studio, I thought there would be a lot more archive footage, but then I, it soon dawned on me that in recording studios, you have their very private space. So you don't really have a lot of photography. You don't have people distracting by filming. So I soon realized there wasn't a lot of extra footage. Yeah. So I did rely heavily on the interviews. I mean, if I hadn't have got dad and I hadn't have got Ringo, then, right. you know, then that would have been difficult. Yeah. But, you know, then Elton John, it wasn't just about like, oh, I need Elton John. It was like, well, Elton John and Jimmy Page from looking at the, recording notes you I found out they were um session musicians there like back when they were teenagers so that was so exciting and interesting to me yeah and then John Williams and George Lucas was seminal for me to get the story around the um film deal that they did which kind of saved Abbey Road so mm -hmm. each interview is really important because I did a certain amount of interviews and then I stopped when it told the story. I didn't do lots more. I kind of did less is more and each one really yeah. sort of hangs on a lot of the story. Mm -hmm. Who did you speak to the longest, would you say? Um, actually, I think most of them were a similar amount of time. I'd have about an hour or just over an hour okay. with, um, the talent so yeah I would say that that was pretty much a lot over the spectrum a similar amount of time listening back to all your interviews and putting together all this there must have been things I mean like you said you you knew a lot but there must have been some surprises what surprised you the most what did you learn the most from this um there were so many surprises actually in thinking about it you asking that question I I probably had the most time with Giles Martin Mm -hmm. because I interviewed Giles Martin but then he agreed to come back when we had we sort of got the original Beatles masters out of a vault which are kept in a secret location and he came back and then we filmed him playing them and talking through because he worked very closely with his father George Martin who was the Beatles producer mm -hmm. so he was really key and he's such a great raconteur I mean he he told the story perfectly so um that was very relevant very important I think and added an extra layer because it was sort of like the interview but then seeing the recordings and him at the sound desk sort of bringing up vocals bringing down you know bringing up sort of orchestral parts mm -hmm. and really explaining the recordings process and sort of taking the recording apart I think was um a, a key point in the documentary too yeah so much I learned. I didn't know that Abbey Road was the first purpose-built studio. I didn't know that they really influenced Beatles by the fact that instruments were just lying around. Like the piano that's on Lady Madonna was called Mrs. Mills Piano because a woman called Mrs. Mills used to record her albums on it at Abbey Road. So that would just be in the studio and they go, oh, let's play that. Or, you know, there'd be orchestras in Studio One and they'd see these Orchestra, orchestras and that would influence them or you know there were comedy recordings at, at Abbey Road so the um, library of comedy sound effects would make their way onto records like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. I didn't know Dark Side of the Moon was recorded there. <laughs> I didn't know that Kate Bush who I'm a huge fan of had directed her own videos there. 
Uh, I didn't know that Ken Townsend had saved it when it, they were talking about making Studio One into a car park because, you know, they were falling on harder times and it wasn't being booked so much. I didn't know Fela Kuti had done three albums there in the early 70s. I mean, I could go on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, it, that's Gold exactly Finger what was recorded there. Yeah. James Bond theme tune was recorded there. So all of these things sort of, and, and you know, as we, you know, one of my favorite sections was Jacqueline Dupre, um, the classical, I kind of tied the whole classical part of the documentary around the fact that Edward Elgott opened the studio in 1931. He wrote this amazing cello concerto that Jacqueline Dupre recorded with her husband, Daniel Barenboim at Abbey Road. And then this amazing ch cellist, Sheku, who's, who's the performer now, recorded it also at Abbey Road. So I interviewed him, had archive footage of Jacqueline Dupre and had Elgar opening it. So those things, for me, I was already a real fan of her music, but I didn't really know Sheku so well and I didn't know that Elgar had opened the studio. So it became this really interesting, complicated, but exciting story to tell. Because as you know, I always had this thing that I didn't want it to become a book of history lesson I wanted it to become this emotional journey that the viewer could come on with us and the reason I had asked you what you learned is because I think everybody who watches this will learn something different and regardless mm -hmm. of you know depending on how much they know about mm -hmm. Abby Road and about the entire journey and I think that it's it's so nice to hear you specifically what surprised you the most and what you learned from it um what I guess what was I know it's it's hard to say you know obviously the biggest challenge is easy to say what was the part that you were the proudest of? I mean, I know you said the part specifically of the doc that you mm -hmm. really enjoyed the most, but this entire process, what do you feel really proud about? I mean, there are, there are a few moments in there, you know, I highlighted the fact that I really love the people that work at Abbey Road and it really does have a very dedicated family feeling. There are people that have been there for a really long time and I wanted to use it as also a, an opportunity to shine a light on them and to express, you know, this, the reason Abbey Road is Abbey Road is yes, it's the building and the amazing studio, but really it boils down to the technical prowess and brilliance of the people that work there. And that is why people keep going back. And that is why, you know, they just provide everything for an artist to be able to get their head down and, and, and work creatively. Um, there's particularly a nice part in the documentary where I talked to Lester, who is like the boffin who's still there today and he has this great little office that I um, work room that I interview him in where he's got like screws and little microphones that he takes apart. But everyone, when I took on the documentary said, have you interviewed Lester? Have you interviewed Lester? Because he's famous there. He, there was something, there was a thing in the, uh, there was a sale called Sale of the Century where they had to, they had too much old equipment, master tape machines and you know, digital recording was coming in. So they needed to sell off a lot of equipment. And Lester was concerned like to save certain things because he had the foresight to be like, this shouldn't go, this needs to stay in the studio. So he just sort of hid things away in little cupboards and drawers. And literally still to this day, people go, oh, remember when we used to have that such and such microphone? And an hour or two later, he'll appear with like, oh, I found this in a drawer. and. You know, he's a legend. He saved so many things. <laughs> that is so amazing. What a great person to have to be part of this. Like that's such he's a so ideal for sure. Well, before we wrap, I, I want to ask for, you know, for those who maybe haven't had a chance to watch, is there one thing in particular about this documentary that stands out to you that would make someone want to check it out? I think the reason to check it out is that when you watch it, you'll understand that everybody that took part in it, you can feel their love and enthusiasm for the space. You know, I think through, through watching it, you kind of really understand why it's still just one of the most world-renowned studios for so many reasons, but mainly because the people that talk about it and that have worked there are just so passionate about it. You can watch If These Walls Can Sing on both Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Thank you so much to our friends at Disney and, of course, to Mary for joining us today. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining for Half Hour With. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mary. It was so nice to meet you.